When my father became very ill towards the middle of 2005, as he was approaching his death, it became very odd for me living there with him. And I graduated college and I was working what I thought was just a summer job, getting ready to join the Ohio State Highway Patrol. Of course, life took a turn and, and here we are. And I ended up staying at my parents' house for almost a year after graduation until I went to seminary with Angela. But during that time, for the first part of it at least, I was able to be there and help my mother as dad went from being mobile to being almost bedridden in a hospital bed that was now sitting in the middle of our living room. And it was very odd to see a man who had always done what he wanted when he wanted to, was pretty active and, and you know, in decent physical condition, although a bit of a belly, much like me now, to watch him go from that to someone who could barely move, who could barely get across the room from there to the bathroom and back. And I'm the youngest child in my family, and I don't just mean I'm the youngest of my four siblings and by a good chunk of years, but I'm also one of the youngest cousins on our side of the family that we interacted with. So growing up, there were no little siblings that I helped to take care of. There were no little cousins that I had to watch over. And even at church, I was one of the youngest kids in my generation, so there were no other little children that, you know, you kind of adopt as a teenager. Our kids do this here. You'll see some of our older high school kids playing with the little ones or, or treating them like younger siblings. It's, it's actually kind of nice. But I didn't have any of that. And so all of a sudden, for the first time, I'm helping to take care of someone, and they're 56, and they're my dad. And it was very awkward, I'll be honest. And it was a totally new dynamic to our relationship, and I wasn't used to it. Now, of course, I've had nieces and nephews. I have my own three children um, and, and been through all of that. But then, then it was a totally new experience and a totally new thing. And I'll be honest, it was disturbing. It was disturbing, that change in dynamic, from being the one that other people had mostly taken care of to being the one who is now taking care of or helping to take care of one of my parents. It was different, being the one who's now cleaning up messes uh, that were made by the bed or in it. It was different helping dad when he struggled to get dressed or to eat. It was different, helping him up when he fell down getting up or getting down in the bathroom, in the hallway, wherever the case may be. And yet, looking back on it, I think that God put me, us, in that situation, or at least used that situation, in order to give my father and I this time. This time to be in this relationship, to have this intimacy, if you will, to have some conversations that needed to happen. God used this disturbance in order that love might be shown and love might be done. For our gospel lesson today, we have the story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. This is one that we normally hear during Holy Week, particularly on Monday, Thursday. But I wanted to highlight it in this series because I think we often underestimate the disturbing nature of this story. Jesus is one that the disciples call rabbi. They call Lord. They see as the son of God, the one bringing good news. Jesus is the one that Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And yet all of a sudden after dinner, Jesus strips down, puts a towel around himself, and washes the disciples' feet. Now, washing feet is not a pleasant job. It's, it's kind of nasty. Remember, these aren't modern-day people with bathrooms and tubs and showers. These are people who walk in sandals or barefoot almost all the time, and they don't bathe on a regular basis. And so to wash someone else's feet is usually a job you reserved for a slave, for a servant. You might, as the host, have your, your uh, guest feet washed, but you aren't doing it. 
Someone else lower in the household will take care of that. And so it is disturbing to have the one you call rabbi and teacher, the one that you admire, get down on their hands and knees and wash your feet. It is something the disciples don't want to happen. No, Lord, I don't want you in that position. I don't want you to be there. I don't want to be here. And yet Jesus does it anyways. Jesus uses this disturbing experience in order to model what love is. Jesus uses this disturbance in order to model what humble service is. Jesus uses this disturbance in order to model what the love of God is. Jesus says, I am washing your feet to show you what it means to live as a disciple. I am washing your feet to show you the attitude and the way in which you should live your life. Jesus knows they're going to go out. They're going to be apostles. They're going to be saints in time. They're going to be people that others look up to, that people revere because they, they saw Jesus. They lived with him. They learned directly from the Messiah. And Jesus doesn't want that to go to their head. And so he gives them this example of service, and he shows them this extreme form of love. And so I think in this there is challenge, there is law, and there is gospel as well. The law is simply whose feet would we wash? Because the example of love that Jesus gives is extreme. Think about it. He doesn't just wash the feet of Peter, the sometimes bumbling but other well otherwise well-meaning disciple. He washes the feet of all the disciples gathered there, including Judas. It's not until about eh, four or five chapters later that we get to Judas going and betraying Jesus for some cash. And so Jesus washes the feet of the man who is to betray him. And that's the model of love and that's the model of service that Jesus leaves to us. And don't underestimate how disturbing that challenge is. (coughs) Whose feet would we wash What type of people would we be willing to serve? Who are we willing to show humility and humbleness in front of? That's the law. That's the challenge that we are presented with. And I'll be honest, I'm a preacher that likes issuing challenges, reminding us what our life of discipleship calls us to. I am a preacher, probably like a lot of preachers, that loves the law because the law is easy to show and the law is easy to throw at and on people. And yet I think what's more important than that is the gospel message that comes through here. Because it's easy to should, y'all. It's easy to say you should do this, you should act this way, you should live in this way, and we as pastors and we as Christians can should one another to death. But before any of that law makes sense and is helpful, we need to hear the good news, and the good news in this story is this, that God washes our feet. Because Jesus is not just a teacher from Galilee. He's not just a rabbi. He's not just a healer. Jesus is God incarnate. God made flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus is the living embodiment of the creator of all things. And it is that living incarnation of the creator that gets down and washes the feet of the disciples, that washes the feet of of Peter and Judas. And it is that creator, the God of all things, Adonai, El Shaddai, all the rest, who shows such amazing love to his creations. And it is that same God that continues to show love to each of us. And that love is truly unconditional. 
And we shouldn't underestimate how disturbing that message is. Because in the rest of our lives, in the rest of the world, love is pretty much conditional. Relationships are pretty much conditional. Our place in the world and our worth to society is pretty much conditional. Let me give you a very easy example, right? The workplace. You are a hardworking and valued employee of a company or of an organization or of a nonprofit until you can't produce, until you lose your edge, until you're not doing your job as nice as we would like you to. And then if you're lucky, at that point you can retire or transfer or find another job. And if you're not, well, sorry, That's the way the world is. And this happens time and again. People become injured and disabled, and all of a sudden, when they are no longer worth it, they are let go. Not in all cases, but let's say in 95% of them. This even happens in the church, right? If a church starts to take a sudden downturn, all of a sudden, the conversations between the board or the council and the pastor become very awkward, But it goes further than that, because a lot of our other relationships are conditional as well. And don't get me wrong, I love country music as much as the next guy, but truly love is not unconditional when it comes to human beings. In a sense, we have to put conditions on it at some point. We may say our love is unconditional for our significant other, but we all know there is a point in which we have to say that's not true. There is a point where we have to say that love can no longer be unconditional, if only to protect ourselves. And I think that's important to point out. If you have a spouse or a partner who is abusing their significant other, that love can no longer be unconditional. It needs to have conditions that keep both uh, the uh, one who is being abused and the abuser safe and probably separate from one another. If you have a parent who is abusing a child or perhaps a grown child abusing an elder, that love can no longer be unconditional. You can't say, well, we love each other unconditionally, so we're just going to let this go on. No, no, there needs to be boundaries and conditions set down for the good of the weaker party. And I know that parents say they will always love their children no matter what. And I don't want to dispute that necessarily, but I do want to make this point. Having worked with some families who have experienced drug abuse, who have experienced children, grown children, who have committed fraud against their parents, who have been emotionally, if not uh, physically, abusive, there is love there, but there is not love for what the child has become. There is love for what the child used to be. Or there is love for what the child may yet be on the other side of rehabilitation, on the other side of repentance and redemption. And that's what makes it different from God's love. I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. Again, at some point we have to put down boundaries for our own good. And we have to protect ourselves from just the brokenness and sinfulness of humanity. But what my point is, is that God's love is so unconditional that God loves that person at their very lowest, at their dirtiest, at their most unclean, at their weakest, at their worst. God's love is still unconditionally present with that person. God's love is unconditionally present with all of us. And even when we seem like a betrayer to God, God washes our feet. God reminds us that we are his beloved children no matter what. And God means no matter what. And that is some good news that we need to continue to hear day after day. That's some good news that I need to hear day after day. And in that disturbing message, people can find life and hope for themselves and for others. And so may we not underestimate 
the challenge that God gives us in this story. To live with humility and to live with the sense and the attitude of a servant. May we not underestimate the disturbing nature of these gospel stories to flip our life and our expectations upside down. And may we never underestimate the disturbingly unconditional nature of God's love, a love that is with us at our best, a love that will be with us in our mediocrity, and a love that will still be with us when we are at our most sinful, broken, at our very worst, when we would rather say, no, God, I'd rather you not see me in this position, in this condition. I don't want you here right now, and I don't want to be here right now. And we never doubt that God is still present and still loving us in that moment. Because that kind of disturbing love is the kind of love that changes the world and changes our lives forever. Amen.